Good morning, George. Good morning, Stephen. How's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, it's going good. Let's see how many people are uh, going to join us here. A little closer. You never realize how I saw the email about uh, PN coaching, so I am been a bit busy, but yeah, I'm gonna go through the next steps or whatever, get that okay. rolling. Nice. All right. How's your week been overall? Good. Landed another new customer, so we're okay. rebuilding, so it's good. Got hit kind of hard with the whole thing. With there were three new customers that kind of put everything on hold, mm -hmm. and then there was there was a few that directly got impacted. So all of their advertising got turned off. So yeah. it is what it is. And others that are kind of gun shy about even advertising at all, and it's like. You should be doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Come over to the gate swing yeah. kind of thing. Well, morning, Carol. Hey, guys. Hi, Carol. A little bit of draw. Here. Boy, I am not an artiste, so bear with me here. Okay, uh, I wanted to demonstrate a squat. Where's my green marker? That's quite something. Anyways. Oh boy. We got a bunch of pros in here. I really don't actually know how much I'm gonna be able to, to share with you to be quite honest. But uh, I mean, if other people wanna jump on at some point, that's cool. Um, okay. So I don't know, how well can you guys see this diagram here? It's good. Yeah? You bet. So you can fairly clearly see it says like stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, and so on. Or is that yeah, still a little tough? No, it looks good. I just maximized the uh, window so I can see it real good. Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, so I figured to start, I want to explain why these things are really important and how they translate over to lifting and then we'll kind of go through, um, I'll do the deadlift and the squat in particular, just so we have a bit of a focus. Um, and, uh, you know, what happens when one of these things is out of place or out of order and how it affects everything else. And then, you know, how that affects your lifting or, or how your lifting affects that. So, um, okay. So one of the things that I learned in the FMS system was this idea of what's called a joint by joint approach. So, what they do is you have at every single, you know, major minor joint in the body, they have, a, they, they assign it a um, 
quality, whether that quality should be stable or whether it should be mobile, right? So starting from the ground up is how they usually recommend it. The diagram that I, I have in my book is a little bit more uh, complex than this, but this is the, the main thing here. So starting from the ground up, you wanna have mobile ankles, right? So basically mobile ankles means that you can get good range of motion on um, your, with, with your ankles and that has a lot to do with how flexible your calves are, right? If your cloud calves are really tight, then mobile ankles are gonna tend to be fairly locked down. Let's say you've got nice mobile ankles, then the next good thing up the chain is stable knees, right? And, and so I've said lots of times, and, and Carol has, and you guys have heard it lots of times, um, that what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that when you're doing stuff like squats or really anything that has your knees under load, right? And by load, I mean weight. When you have uh, knees, your knees supporting some weight and then going through some range of motion, you need to have stability there at the knees because they, uh, they, they bear up the femur and then further up the trunk and the hip. So um, having stable knees is the next component of a, a healthy and, and uh, person who is you know, in optimal uh, position to lift and get all the, all the benefits of lifting, right? Um, so the next, next up the, the rung there is mobile hips, right? So when we're talking about hips, I should, I should specify, we're not talking lumbar spine. We're talking this area here, okay? You wanna make sure that these are mobile, and the reason for that is because if you want to move and articulate your hips back and forward like you need to when you're doing movement, especially sports or athletic type movement, like running, like jumping, like lifting, right, with uh, deadlifts or squats, or really most athletic endeavors, your hips need to be able, able to easily articulate back and forth to allow for you to uh, move healthily and optimally. I just really got a notification, that's just something else. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you got mobile ankles, you got stable knees, and you got mobile hips, chances are, unless there's some sort of other underlying condition that is unrelated to the way you move, you will have a stable lumbar spine. And this is huge, right? Because so, so many people deal with lower back pain. So when we're talking lumbar spine, we're talking from roughly, well, we're talking from the, uh, the bottom of the tailbone area here to, you know, maybe about there. So I'm not, you know, a doctor. I'm not super, super, I'm not gonna try to pretend like I know exactly where the L spine ends, right? So, and you know, stability through there basically means that if you have stability, then what's nice is you can handle a lot of compressive forces on your body, right? Which is weights, right? And that's kind of how we're relating it here in, uh, in life or in, in lifting, sorry. Um, if your spine is, if your lumbar spine is not stable, right? You have those little um, like uh, discs, right? And you've, we all heard of like a, a, a disc bulge or, or a herniated disc or all those things, right? Those are all, or those are usually, I'll say, the result of having been in a situation where you did not have a stable lumbar spine and then there were excessive compressive forces on one side of the spine and it caused the cushion or the pad between two joints, right? Let's say you've got, like, you got your whatever, L, L3, L4, we'll say, whatever it is, right? So this is the, top, the bottom of the higher disc and this is the top of the lower disc, right? And there's a little bursa or a little cushioning in between, right? But let's say you picked up a refrigerator that was way too heavy for you to pick up and in order to get it from here to here, you've got a lot of wrenching back through your spine, right? Now there's a pinching thing that happens and now, because you have um, your, uh, oh, what's it called now? Your uh... spinal cord? Yes, there we go. Spinal cord, wow, just mind blank there. Spinal cord, which runs up and through, and it ties into so many other nerves, and there's so many other nerve trees and roots that come in and um, are directly related to that 
at the spine, right? They connect into the main central uh, spinal cord. You get this pinch sensation, which is already discomforting because now you've got bone, more bone on bone action type happening, type thing happening. The bursa is slipping out the other end and then any and all nerves that are in that area now can very quickly become inflamed because in a lot of cases they become pinched or there's an excessive rubbing that'll happen along them. And so having a stable lumbar spine that is adequate to do whatever uh, you're throwing at it, whatever task you're asking it to do is hugely, hugely important. So let's say you've got a stable lumbar spine. Chances are, if that happens, you will have a mobile T-spine, right? And so T-spine is from approximately, we'll say, you know, mid upper back all the way up to your, uh, just below where your, where your, I'd say where your neck, we can kind of think of it as, as the neck starts, right? From there up, it's, it's cervical spine. But, um, and so, the uh, things that happen if you don't have a mobile T-spine are that's where you start getting stuff like the whole over shoulders thing. That's where you start getting issues like, um, you know, just general shoulder pain. That's actually the origin of a lot of uh, different types of uh, tendonitis that happen down over here. And uh, just so many other issues. A lot of people have extremely, extremely tight triceps. And uh, it's funny, my mom uh, came to me after, talk, talked to me one evening after a massage, and she said, you know, I've always had really, really, really tight triceps. And I thought, hey, there was a lot of muscle there because she would feel the, the, the back of her arm and she could feel like it was very hard and, and sort of rough in texture. And, uh, and anyways, but then she said she went to a massage one evening and she got a massage and then when she touched her arm layer later she was shocked to find that at least at that time after the massage suddenly it didn't feel so you know um dense and hard and sort of rough in texture there right and then she realized actually it's it's a lot to do with having um extremely extremely tight muscles in that area and some, and another quality of these muscles, which is called tone. Tone is sort of this, oh boy, uh, it's sort of like this, um, oh man, it's, it's a quality of a muscle. So you, you think of it like a, it, it, yeah, I guess it would be a tightness or it'd be sort of a texture to the muscle when it has been placed repeatedly or chronically under a lot of stress. That'd be kind of, the most practical way I can explain it, I think. Anyways, so mobile T-spine is important because anything related to the shoulders and down through the arms is going to be affected by that T-spine. But also, if you do not have a mobile T-spine, what often happens, actually, and these are interrelated, let's say I've got a really tight T-spine, right? So when I'm going to do an overhead press then, what will happen is instead of my shoulders and my back being able to reach good thoracic extension here. Rather, what will happen is since this is so tight, I'll rather end up arching through here because my body's looking for some way, shape, or form to get that weight up. And because all these joints being uh, mobile or stable are interrelated, if you've got a tight T-spine, chances are you have some degree of um, an unstable lumbar spine, which means it becomes more easy to arch your back, your low back as you press overhead and get the weight overhead out in front of you, as opposed to being able to keep the lumbar spine stable and allow your mobile T-spine to simply push the weight up directly above you. From there, right, yeah, mobile T-spine, if you, let's say the ideal scenario, right, you're, you're completely healthy, no other issues, uh, you've got everything else in place, mobile T-spine. Then lastly, you have stable shoulders. And that's what I was talking about with, you know, some of the stuff relating to if you are dealing with some shoulder pain or chronic shoulder pain specifically, um, you know, oftentimes that comes from some of the other things down the list. So, um, 
Let's kind of talk about what happens if you don't have mobile ankles. So if you don't have mobile ankles, what'll happen is we can now say, we can call these, you know, we can say stable ankles, right? That is stable is usually used as a, as a positive term. So maybe stable isn't the right word. Maybe it's more like tight or um, locked up ankles, right? Let's say you're locking, your ankles lock up. And now I ask you to do a squat, right? So you can see on my little guy here doing the squat, I haven't finished him, but you can see that the ankles need to be able to flex a whole heck of a lot to get down into a nice squat, right? But, well, I'm demanding that of my body, but my <clears throat> ankles sure as heck aren't going to do that, and they're especially not gonna do it under load. So where's the next joint where I'm gonna try to get things moving. Well, the next joint that's the closest neighboring up would then be my knees. So if I've got really tight ankles or tight calves and locked up ankles where they don't want to move, that torsion, the force required by my body to execute some form of, of sitting down into a squat with weight, right? Well, my body's going to find a way to do that. And so what happens there is the knees, they get over-involved. So they will either go through an excessive range of motion through which maybe they shouldn't be going. That doesn't mean you shouldn't squat deep, by the way. It just means they're going to go through an excessive range of motion through which they shouldn't be going. Or they are going to find, or, or you're going to find that you get a lot of collapsing inward of the knees. And that can be both related to hip tightness or ankle tightness. And so, that's part of the, that's, well, really, that's essentially the study of, and the practice of physiotherapy and these different therapies is they're experts, honestly. They're experts, and it's amazing watching them. They're experts at figuring out, okay, so this guy's knees are trembling, and he always talks about having knee pain all the time. So we need to do some tests to figure out, is it a really tight set of hips? Is it really tight set, uh, tight set of ankles? Or, you know, slash calves? Or is it maybe a combination of both? And just because the real world is never as black and white as this whiteboard and these black figures, it usually is a combination of both. And they're often interrelated. So then from there, after the, the um, physio completes the tests on the person, that's where they'll start to administer stretches, right? So maybe they'll say, okay, first thing we want to do is have you stretch your ankles, or not stretch your ankles, but stretch the muscles, the calves, basically giving you more ankle mobility and we want you to do some strengthening for your hips because we can't be quite sure which caused which first, right? We just know that the knees are kind of caught in between here and we need to make sure that your ankles, we can clearly see they're tight and we can also see your hips have some degree of tightness. So we're going to make sure these ankles are more mobile, but we also need to make sure that the hips are strong enough to handle what the knees and the ankles are trying to bear right now. And the reason why I say strong enough is because mobility isn't just simply, um, it, mobility and flexibility aren't the same. So mobility has the idea of being able to go through an entire range of motion in a controlled way. Whereas flexibility is if, George, if I had you lying on your back and I took your leg up and, and lifted it and then we just saw how straight you could, I could lift your leg up before your knee wanted to bend. That would be flexibility. Flexibility is like an inherent property of a given material, right? Like, you know, concrete is not very flexible, right? Our muscles are a whole lot more flexible than concrete. But mobility is more so how well can my body move through an active range of motion, okay? So, then let's say, uh, yeah, you got those shaky knees, right? What do we usually recommend then if somebody is really struggling with knee collapse on the, on the squat, for example, right? We'll tell them to grab a band and we'll tell them to put it around their knees. The reason why we do this is because when we get the band around the knees, it's nice as a cueing tool, especially if somebody's really new to lifting. If somebody's really, really new to lifting, sometimes it'll just be literally, they, they, they've never really squatted before like the way we were, were, uh, we're asking them to here. And so they just need to be taught. I'll show you here a little bit. 
Oh my goodness, Stephen, are you kidding me? Okay. Anyways, I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Okay. They just need to be taught that they need to have their knees push outward. And so this is where the skill of lifting comes in, right? When we're talking about what is, you know, what, why, why is lifting a skill? It's because some people don't know that what needs to happen is that as they sit down, their knees should actually track outward towards the outside of their toes. So oftentimes, if somebody's really inexperienced, they'll stand way too close, and then they'll bend their knees first, and then they'll try to sit back in the squat. They don't know how to load their hips. Um, guys, I'm gonna be right back. Give me one second here. Morning, Carol. Hey, how are you guys? Good. Good. Quiet morning so far. Well, one's off to work. Nicholas is off to work to Superstore. Okay. And uh, well, one's sleeping and the other one's showered already. So. Okay. <laughs> Being recorded, so this part will just get edited out. <laughs> right. That's fine. The chit chat. <laughs> <It's the> part <laughs> Stevens thing. Getting a lot of home time. Yeah, a lot of home time, but the home time is busy time, right? Like when it's, you're trying to help two or three kids with their work. Exactly. And all the different subjects, especially like, you know, in high school, it's yeah. not all following the same format, right? Every teacher has their own website or their own this or that. And is I guess it all Microsoft Teams for you. Yes. Yeah. We have that. There's also something called Moodle. Have you heard of that? Which one? Moodle, yeah, one of his classes is on there. And I guess I'm, I'm just still trying to make sure he's on top of things, grade nine, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, oh, even yeah. the Microsoft Teams, I, I'm looking here and I'm looking there and the teacher said, I, this should be here. And it's like, well, where is it? Oh, I know there's so many different layers to that, right? Yeah, like there are a lot of different layers. headings and different places you can go and do with it. But, and then there's not always, assignments posted in the morning, sometimes they only come in the afternoon, so you've got to constantly be checking and yes. Anyways, mm. just kind of trying to keep those kids motivated and and the younger one I'm like sitting side by side with, right? Doing lots of one on one. So different days. <laughs> but mm. yes, definitely some are better than others doing their own thing and getting it yeah. done. And then some some kids then you have to sit there and push them the whole time. Exactly. Yeah. If you've got that drive, like in yeah. you, then it's parents can kind of take a step back, right? Yeah. But not all kids have that drive or want to have it right now. Maybe they'll have it later, I hope. I think so. I, I'm hoping maturity will help with that too. That is true. Like once I reach mm -hmm. a certain point in my life, I was like, okay, now stuff is about to get real. Like now when I need, you went to college yeah, instead of high school. Now, now right. I need, now I need to take this seriously and Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully it happens before they whatever, before they're done high school, but Exactly. I, I took high school seriously. I had good marks. <laughs> I, I you were good students. <laughs> there my parents didn't care if I if I quit or, you know, quit school or not. So then I had to have the drive, not them. Right, right. Yeah, it was hijacking your your thing here, Stephen. With just you know what, not a big deal. I uh, I don't mind because uh, I really, really, really um, I made a mess. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? I had I had a wonderful I had a wonderful cup of coffee. Oh no! And I definitely, definitely spilled it. Oh, <laughs> Ours are safely on our desks here. I, uh, I should have maybe, should have maybe, uh, should have maybe hit stop record because. Well, well, you can edit it out, right, Stephen? I mean, I guess. Yeah, and you can hear a great conversation about our kids and education and stuff. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, and my uh, my brother's just finishing up his last year of high school. So, like, he, he, uh, yeah, it's definitely interesting because for me, like, I would have really, really thrived under these circumstances, which mm -hmm. I was just, like, blasted through everything. I was, I was uh, raised on, like, Christian Light education uh, curriculum through 
uh, grades two to six. And, uh, and so it's just 10 books if you complete in a year. And me and my, I, I was doing the school with my cousin at a private school and we would race through the year to see who could finish quicker. So like we would, I was sometimes done by like late April. Wow. Good job. Steve. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, but Josh, my brother, he, <laughs> he kind of struggles with it. And yeah, I, I was hearing you guys were sharing there about how it's hard to keep, hard to keep some of them motivated, that kind of thing. Maybe Actually, that's not. last year, right, Stephen? Yes, this is his last year, yeah. Hmm. Well, it's too bad he can't finish with his friends and stuff. Yeah, I know, right? It is too bad. Yeah. Bradley. Anyways, okay, let's quickly get, uh, get back into this, and then, yeah. So, right. But let's say somebody is dealing with, you know, I was saying how some people, if, if you're new, sometimes it's just a matter of, of, uh, of using that mini band, right, around the knees to tell them, okay, so now, now they can feel tension, right? So it's, if you give them something to push against, then they can push, right? So then it's just a matter of telling them you need to, you know, push your knees out against the band and sit down for the squat. And the reason why this, why this helps to quote unquote load the hips is because your hamstrings and your glutes as they tie in up here into your hips, if your knees pop out this way, right, and you sit back, they get placed under tension. They get placed under load, right? And so they go under, undergo what's called an eccentric contraction as you sit down. When your body is, is placed, when any muscle is placed in an eccentric position, think of it like a rubber band that's being stretched, right? What does the rubber band want to do? It wants to pull back in. It wants to contract back in. So that's the beauty of having a nice, good eccentric contraction, a controlled descent or controlled downward portion to the squat is it basically puts you in this optimal position to come out of the hole, right, to the bottom of the squat. And because now the, the rubber bands are placed on stretch and then you can, you can get out no problem. And so uh, it protects your knees because now your knees don't have to do excessive amounts of of this kind of thing where, you know, I'm here and then let's say I don't, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm either new to lifting or I don't trust my hips because they're not strong enough. What'll happen then is the knees kind of go forward first, right? So you can see that, let's say I'm doing a squat and I've got the weight here. That bar with that weight is now moving further away from the center line of my body because I'm, my knees are going out and my torso is not wanting to come over really because if I was to come over with my torso, then it would, you know, then I would be now completely falling forward. So then from there, what will happen is oftentimes people will start to sit back a bit more. But if they sit back more, what happens then? Well, they arch their back a bit more. So then you start to get this kind of thing, right? And so you can see how one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next kind of thing where suddenly now <laughs> somebody who was dealing with knee issues is now having to deal with, you know, some, some lower back issues, or they say they can feel their lower back when they squat. And that's, uh, it's, it's been a really, really odd one for me, at least as a coach to work through with people who, who say, cause usually most people say they feel their lower back on like a deadlift or a barbell row where they're in that bent over position like this. Right. But if you feel your lower back on the squat, um, it's kind of an odd thing because normally your, your joints are stacked, but usually it has to do with that excessive pelvic tilt, right? Because your lumbar spine, like I was saying earlier, you need to have a stable lumbar spine, right? So you can see then if you don't have mobile ankles, your knees become unstable, which then puts the next joint up the line at risk, which then makes sure because your body's gonna find, again, some way to make sure that it can move through the patterns you're requiring. So tight, or tight you know, locked up ankles, unstable knees, locked up hips, unstable lower back, locked up T-spine, and then unstable shoulders, right? So it's all related. And so that's why it's really important to go in and work on regaining a couple of these key things so that you can have stable shoulders, so you can have a stable lumbar spine, you can have stable knees, right? So that's why a lot of what you'll see as far as mobility drills and strengthening and stretching 
will be related to these, uh, the, the areas of mobility, right? Because your shoulders more so, you can work your shoulders out, sure. But usually they're thought of maybe more in terms of your skeletal structure, right? So then the, the muscles of your T-spine though, right? That's more so a, an area you can work as opposed to the joints, right? Because I can take, I can force my arm back and I can force it into all sorts of positions. It doesn't mean my shoulder is stable. Whereas the, uh, the muscles of my T-spine, if I'm strengthening my, my mid back and between my shoulder blades, right? that will give me a more mobile T-spine because I'll be able to increase the range of motion at which I kind of go through, right, actively, or push back like that, forward and back. Anyways, um, okay, let's see here. So as it relates to, so like, okay, so let's talk about the mobile hips, right? So let's say I do a lot of sitting, right? We hear this a lot. You, uh, you do a lot of sitting and so your hip flexors are really tight, right? So why does that, why does that irritate things, right? Let's say your, your ankles are just fine, and, uh, but your knees still hurt when you do a squat. And it's hips, you know, we can kind of talk about hips, okay. So with the hips there, a lot of it can come from the fact that because you don't have enough strength, you can't take your hips, because the hips don't lie, you can't take them through an active range of motion with a certain load or weight or, uh, or even, you know, just even moving back and forth uh, is, is hard. They're not mobile, right? So what happens is they'll often drag either the knees or the lumbar spine along with them because this whole area is locked up. With mobility, it should be able to, it should be able to, to tighten up and give you, you know, rigidity when you need rigidity, but it should also be able to kind of loosen up and move when you need it to move, right? And so for example, right, why at the top of a squat, right? When I'm just up here, right? My glutes are in a fully contracted position and my hips are giving my lump, like are giving are rigid, right? So they, they, in that moment, you wouldn't say that they're mobile because they're locked in place. But the beauty is at the top, that provides me with the most stable base on which to stack my lumbar spine, my T-spine and my shoulders. And same thing with below. That rigidity here allows my knees to stay in a position where they aren't hyperextended. They're not bent forward a whole bunch, but the joints all stack on top of one another, another very, very nicely. And so <clears throat> having mobile hips is honestly one of the, is, I'd say I would lean towards that being the biggest key to fixing a lot of the stuff in the lower body, but also some of the stuff in the upper body too. You know, when you get to the bottom of the squat, if you've got already really, really tight hip flexors, that's gonna result in, well, if you walk around a bit like this, right? You can kind of see my butt there. If you walk around a little bit like this because you've got really tight hip flexors up here in the front side, it's only gonna get worse when you get to the bottom. Because now you're, 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 if you walk around like this, your lumbar spine is already in an unstable position. So if I get you to squat down, What's going to happen is since this area is so tight, it's going to wrench this down further, which is then going to cause more arch up in your back, which is then going to cause a tugging sensation here through your knees because you are requiring it. Instead of loading up your hips back here properly, you're asking your front side, these already tight muscles to do, to be loaded more and to be pulled more. And so then what you'll get is this tugging sensation up from your knees through your quads and into your hip flexors. And then you get sort of a, a really big arch like that. And it really can cause a lot of issues. On the flip side of things, let's say it's not too bad when you come down, right? But when you come up, then the first thing you notice is like that, right? And that's because you're not actually engaging your glutes the way you need to, right? You're down here, your hip flexors are tight and your glutes aren't necessarily strong enough. When I use the word strong enough and, and when I'm using the word weak here, I'm talking about is the muscle or the muscle group adequate to handle what you're putting it through, right? So I'm not saying it's inherently weak. You might be just fine, you know, walking in your day-to-day -day life, no issues. And, uh, and so, but then when I ask you to do, you know, a barbell squat or a kettlebell squat, you get to the bottom, right? And now when I ask you to come out of it, 
first thing that happens is I go from here and then I arch. Because I know I gotta get my torso up, right? My, I inherently know that. And so what happens is I'm in here and then I end up kind of cranking up and then my knees lock up first and I arrive at the top like this. Same thing with a deadlift, right? A lot of times we're doing a deadlift and what you'll do is, it looks pretty good at the top, or as you, as, you, um, as you come up, but then at about halfway or so, all of a sudden, it starts to look a bit like this. And that's because you didn't successfully engage your glutes, or at least they weren't adequate to the task of getting your, of bearing you up as you were approaching you know, midpoint and then upward to the top of the lift from there. Um, okay. So basically what I'm saying is hips, hugely, hugely important. I know that's not super profound, but you can see a couple of the issues that happen when you don't have um, mobile hips, right? Very, very often it's where that affects your lower back. Something I'll add in to this is, remember how I said everything's related? So if you have an issue with having your, your, your glutes or your hips be strong enough, mobile enough to take your body through the active range of motion, you'll also usually have a core that is weak. That doesn't mean you can't do a million crunches. It doesn't mean that you can't um, you know, do a lot of ab work. What it, does mean, what it does mean is for the task of, again, supporting the structure that is your lumbar spine, that is the weight that's stacked up here at your shoulders, you do not have a sufficient um, trunk strength to bear that weight up or to, to hold that weight in place. So again, one thing that would help to pull the hip flexors open a bit more, right? Because it, when I was saying how they're short and tight would be if the trunk muscles here, right? Pulled up and in. And you can see that if I were to pull my muscles up and in, it would run with bare my back out straighter, right? So now I've got this sort of girded up position that holds me in place. And then now when I sit down in the squat, my back still stays relatively straight. There isn't excessive arch, right? And so these things kind of come part and parcel together, the weak hips and the core. So um, I'll use a little bit of an example of um, a personal training client of mine and uh, she's doing fantastic now. But honestly, let me tell you, I walk into every session worried at the very beginning. She's very, very knowledgeable because she's a doctor and it's very nerve wracking working with her because she knows exactly what the muscles are. She knows exactly what joints she's, you know, hinging, moving and stuff. And it felt like it was every other, every two to three sessions, she would finish the session and she would be okay. But then very often later, you know, it'd be a few minutes later, I would get a text and she'd be like, I just threw my back out or I'm dealing with a lot of back pain. And so, some, so something to realize is if you're, if you're in a susceptible position like that, right, where you're dealing with that kind of pain, the first, the first step is mitigation. You've got to make sure that you're not going to do stuff that's going to re-aggravate the situation that is already a, a condition underlying. And then the second step is to strengthen, which is very, very, honestly, it's shocking how little needs to be done to strengthen um, in that way, right? Because strengthen in, in the sense of with what she was dealing with, which is where she was coming in because she was dealing with lower back pain and she just wants to, she wants to do a trip in Italy um, where she's going to walk, walk and hold a backpack, right? But the issue, of course, is she knew from having, she bought a backpack, she loaded it up with approximately the weight she'd need, right? But she walks a little bit like this. And now imagine walking through the towns and the hills of Italy, and you've got weight on your shoulders, right? So they pull you down, and then, but your body wants to keep your center of gravity, so then you got this kind of situation happening here. So what I did is, to start, I couldn't take her through anything. Like, I couldn't get her, I couldn't get her to do this. If I got her to do this, and I got her to do it for reps, she would tell me she felt it. If I got her to do, a core exercise. If I, she actually still, to this day, um, well, maybe not to this day because it was a few weeks back, but um, she still told me she could feel it a little bit. There wasn't the flare up, which was absolutely fantastic. But to this day, 
she would really struggle with something like that and bring it back in and really back in. And I'm not, I'm not bashing her. What I'm saying is the first step was to get her hips, her glutes strong enough and her core stable enough, right? So what I did was when it came to core work, I did only things that would have her holding a certain position because that way I wasn't placing stress on her lumbar spine. If she could hold the position and keep her core braced and cinched in, it would hold this flat, which would then not aggravate it, right? So that's that mitigation step. On the other side of things, right, we're strengthening her core, which then holds her straighter here. When it came to hinging stuff, it was literally stuff like I would have her do a bodyweight squat. But I would watch her and I would tell her, okay, we're gonna try for 10 reps. But the second I see this happen, or on the other side of things, right? Maybe she had a, maybe she looked pretty good going down, but maybe it was rep number four or five, right? The second I see this happen, right? That's the end of the set. And so sometimes it would be three reps, sometimes it would be four reps. It was an excruciating process, but I had to, I absolutely had to get her moving so that things stayed strict. And you can see that as I came up there just barely, that was a good rep because of the fact that everything stayed um, pulled together and my glutes, especially at the top, brought my pelvis here like this. So everything, all my joints from my lump, from my tailbone, straight up through my upper back and shoulders where everything was nice and stacked. And uh, so I'm just using, I'm not, I'm not bashing on her, but definitely was, there was a, a period of time there for a few months where it was a lot of figuring things out and just shocking how little there was that needed to be done before she really, really, um, well, either, yeah, she had a flare up or, but then on the, on the other side of things, it was shocking how little needs to be done to have an effective workout for her. Um, and so as it relates to dealing with, with, uh, with if you're having an injury or if you're having that kind of thing, you might be shocked as to how little you need to do to correct that injury, um, which is why physio often looks so incredibly simple, yet it's very, very hard to do because when we think of working out and we think of strengthening ourselves, we think of lifting weights, we think of the barbell, we think of kettlebells, we think of high intensity workouts, and um, that definition of strengthening is a little bit different from the definition that I would use here with this, with this lady. Um, and so anyways, okay. So I was talking about the, uh, the squat, right? A lot of the same things can happen with the deadlift. And so with the deadlift, let's get some markers here. I don't even know if I'm gonna use them, but we'll see. What can often happen with the deadlift is, with, this, with a squat, for example, you need to make sure that you be, are able to get your hands back far enough because it does, again, have to do with that whole mobile T-spine idea, which then gives you stable shoulders. But where those stable shoulders start to become a lot more important is on the deadlift. Because now, with the deadlift, you're pulling weight off the floor, right? And so now, this whole area right here needs to be able to handle that weight without causing the T-spine to round over this way, right? So, when, again, with the mobile T-spine, really what it means is that these muscles in your upper back are strong enough to counteract whatever weight it is that you're using. So then uh, you can even go so far as to say that in some cases, a weak T-spine or a weak, weak upper back muscles, which hold your T-spine in place, results in shoulder pain, which is a very interesting idea because it's like, I don't feel pain unless I do this or unless I do a bench press with too much weight or let's say I do a side lateral raise, right? But the thing is, when you're doing a deadlift, the bar and the weight are dragging your arms out of their socket like so, especially if you're dealing with unstable shoulders, right? The, the weight is just pulling down. But again, there are nerves that run through the shoulder capsule and there are also bursa or bursae, plural, that get put under pressure or pinched 
when you put yourself in vulnerable positions like this one where you're where the weight is too much for your shoulders to handle so you, here's the thing your hips might be fine you might be talking saying oh there's no problem with my lower back my knees are fine but it's weird because if i lift really heavy i start to notice that i get shoulder pain maybe after or maybe it, you just notice it on a different shoulder exercise later in the workout that you're like wow oh, that doesn't feel really good and it all has to do with the fact that now this has all been pulled forward. And so because it's been pulled forward, these muscles have been placed on stretch when really they should have been doing a static or isometric contraction, bearing everything in tight. So now the shoulder is hanging loose, looser, I'll say, in the joint. So let's say we finished off the deadlifts and now you're doing, you know, an overhead press, right? So you start to go for your overhead press. And it might not even be noticeable in terms of like, this is where coaching is, is pretty tough because it's not noticeable in the sense of, um, you know, when you're, when you're pressing overhead, I'm not seeing that, you know, when you walked into class, you were, you were, you know, you were walking like this and now, you know, after the deadlifts, you're walking like this. It's not usually that noticeable. Um, but I'm, what I'm relating it to is I'm relating it to how these compound lifts and how, these full body movements, right? That have to do with, that integrate all these relate to some of the smaller areas of working out or smaller muscle groups, right? So now your shoulders are a, just a little bit less stable. They're just a little bit looser in the joint and these muscles in your upper back that were supposed to be contracting here like this are now a little bit more stretched, right? Well now when I, when I push overhead, right? My shoulder, is now sitting a little bit more forward, right? And that's why, for example, on TRX rows, people always, or I notice that people like, like to kind of let the, the thing drag them out and then they'll pull from there and then they drag it out and pull from there, All right? And I really, really don't like that because every time you do that, especially, especially if you're getting dragged out and then you pull back in with your arm rather than your upper back muscles, really, you're just stretching at this and you're working your bicep. And then what else do people feel when they do a lot of TRX stuff? Tennis elbow. Tennis elbow, exactly. And right, that's directly related to the fact that they're not getting their upper back properly engaged. And so then the bicep gets tight, pulls on these tendons up here. This feels uncomfortable. The bicep's tight on this side of things because there's they're the top of the bicep, one of the heads at least, runs directly right up to the shoulder here. Right, so that drags this forward more, which then causes more stretch here. So then it becomes a worse and worse problem over time, which is bad. So then, uh, right, so the shoulder's unstable and now I'm pressing overhead, right? The top of the humerus, right, which is the top of your, your shoulder here, it's a little bit, it's got a little ball end, right, and it's got the socket. Well now, it's not sitting at where it should be in the socket. It's kind of sitting a bit more forward. And so you have these little bursa that are, that kind of sit between that. So it allows the joint to slide smoothly in the, in the uh, inside the socket. But the issue is now those bursa are getting pinched or in some cases it can be a nerve that's getting pinched. And then that's where you, usually if it's shooting pain, that's a nerve. If it's, soreness or discomfort as you press overhead, you're dealing with some sort of bursal inflammation. So <clears throat> it's that pressure as you're requiring the arm to lift or move inside the joint that causes that pain sensation. That's, that's why, for example, on the really heavy lifting days, like our five rep days, we'll often do uh, band pull parts as a finisher. I like that finisher a lot. I really, really like it because it takes your shoulders lightweight it takes your shoulders through thoracic extension in this plane of motion but then also this plane of motion and then the beauty is too because you're working against resistance and strengthening those muscles like that when you reach overhead and you pull apart you get a little bit more um, action of the shoulder blades in a way that it does they don't necessarily usually work and so they can often be very weak when it comes to this overhead and this kind of outward portion of the, of the overhead, of the pull parts. Um, 
So that's kind of how that relates there. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, what else did I want to go over? Anyways, you know what? Actually, I'll open up to questions. I've been talking for like a long time. Any questions or am I just kind of talking at you? You know, is it interesting? I is have it a question. Yeah. Okay, so I notice my shoulder blades hurt a lot too. Okay. And when I do do stuff like deadlift, I try to um, engage my shoulders. But yep. when I'm doing it, I'm often thinking, I feel like I go out of it when I'm trying really hard to stay in it. So how right. do I get my shoulder blades like... Lighter weight? Well, um, I don't even go heavy. It's just, I feel like I can't stay in the shoulders locked kind of thing when I'm doing things. You know what I mean? Right. That's a good question. Um, hmm. I want to I do I have, like, I have lift recently. That's where the whole like on the floor coaching thing comes in, into play. Generally, what I would say is those band pull parts will help for strengthening that. But honestly, it could be as simple as like, do you find that you have pain? I know when I roll out later that my shoulders are very sore. Like I, I try to just lay on the roll, on the thing on my shoulders and just relax as much as I can because right. they feel like they're very tender, like they've been beat up like crazy. Okay. I see. Yeah. So I think it's probably going to have to do a little bit with that whole dose uh, relationship that I was talking about with the uh, lady I used for my example earlier. Um, I know it feels like lightweight. That's the thing, right? Um, it feels like lightweight when you're deadlifting. And I'm not saying that you need to go lighter necessarily. Um, when we get back in full sessions here, I would really, really like to see, um, really like to see how you deadlift. And, and there might be something where it's just a small portion of the movement that you're just not, you know, it's not pattern wise. It's just, it's a, it's a little bug in the system kind of thing. Um, and that could be really, really simply fixed. Um, but another thing it could be is just, I know, you know, you can physically lift that weight, but it might not be the right time to do it right now because you need to strengthen, um, and some other areas. And when I say strengthen, I'm using, I'm using the word in that, in that context, like I'm using it when I talk about that, the lady that I used for my example earlier, where, like I said, it's shocking how little weight um, or, or tension or difficulty um, she had to use or go through to get a good workout in, right? So like, it, it can be very frustrating and uh, because it's like, I know I can lift more than this. I know I can, I'm stronger than this, right? And you are, that's the thing, you are. Physically, even, even from the weight that you have deadlifted on a regular basis when we were doing the in-person sessions here, Helen, legitimately, I know you can lift and physically move more weight than that, but it can be, it can be a bit of a process where you have to really say, if my goal with lifting and with training is to feel good and to feel healthy and to get stronger that way, then I'm going to put maybe, you know, well, I'm not saying you have a big ego, but I know for myself. <laughs> it's, hey, here's the thing. Well, legitimately, legitimately, right? It's, it's been a process for me where, you know, I, I did lift at 405 for the last time in, in late 2019. And I hadn't done that in two years because I knew there were a lot of bugs in my system. I knew I could go in physically any day of the week that I had, you know, a reasonable amount of food and felt reasonably good. I could go load the weight up and physically move the weight up. I left it alone for that entire period of time because it was super, super, super important to me to make sure that I had a lot of different things lined up and that I felt confident and that my body could move a certain way before I went and did this achievement that I, I technically physically knew I could already do. Right. So there's just a, there's a difference between, yeah, I guess, um, strengthening when it comes to for the sake of feeling good and feeling healthy and feeling well, Versus um, just as it relates to, you know, um, body composition goals and, and, you know, lifting so that you feel like you lifted heavy or like you had a hard workout or that kind of thing. I don't have to lift heavy. That doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, with the shoulders too, overhead. Yeah, I can feel it quite often that all of a sudden it feels like a little lightning bolt, you know, zzz, mm. you know and it's like, oh, oh, no. Yeah, oh yeah totally. Or yeah. even, uh, well, the 
squatting squat. like the back squats, I can't get my arms back far enough to do right. that okay. without, you know? Okay. It feels like That's I don't have enough do the, flexibility to... That's why you do the other bar or whatever, the safety Exactly. Bar. That's why I use the safety bar. Okay. So that really does sound a lot like from this thing here, mm -hmm. a lot like a, uh, a, a tight T-spine and unstable shoulders. Mm -hmm. So um, to start, I would say, uh, well, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll put together a little at-home bands thing for you. So it's going to combine a little bit of stretching on the front side here through your pecs. Mm -hmm. And then it'll add some strengthening in on the back side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Perfect. I'll so jump I'll, in on that because I got shoulder issues now and then too, and mine are going away again now. But, but all, it's because we don't sudden, do the strong heavy weights. All of a sudden they come back again. So I, right. I'll totally jump in on the, the shoulder, T-spine stretching thing or whatever. Cool. I'm going to make a little note. Just give me one second. <clears throat> And some of the discomfort that you were, I was just thinking as I was getting a notepad here, um, some of the discomfort that you could be feeling from that after a workout where you've done that too, could be because if you're dealing with a lot of tightness, you know, in the front, in the pecs here, that is part of what pulls things forward as well, yeah. right? So now um, your body's not re really quite as used to holding everything back the way it has. And so it can feel, it can feel quite a lot. You can feel quite a lot of discomfort after a work uh, or after a workout when you're rolling your back or getting on there, it can feel quite tender because those muscles are actually kind of, um, well, if you just think of it in terms of like, uh, like, you know, um, like, uh, uh, like a hydro pole and then it has the, the steel cable that comes off of it or any sort of thing where you have sort of like these girders, right? Um, it can cause a little dis a lot of discomfort in your body because now it's sort of like you're being pulled back like this. And even if you've, um, if you've been doing that for an hour, right, you still have the other 23 hours of the day where there's a certain way that your shoulders sit and they're used to sitting like that for years, right? So I, I know it can, um, I, I know we're strengthening it for an hour here and that kind of thing, but it really, oh man, how do I say it? It's like, it, it's such a, it is really a, such a small part of, um, of the day that, uh, it's just, it, it still kind of gets overridden, I guess, by the amount of time that your shoulders end up being in this forward position. Um, so yeah, I'll do some, some T-spine stretches or some, um, I'll do, I'll just write T-spine. <clears throat> I have a comment about squats or uh, maybe a question, maybe a comment, but okay. so yeah, when I look back at old videos, I think we've talked about this in the gym before I look back at old videos of squatting and I just don't have any depth and I'm lifting these numbers or whatever, just to put a, a, a nice number on my chart or whatever. So whatever, it looks kind of silly when you look at those old videos. Mm -hmm. So then when I started doing more deep squats, that's when I think, well, I think the, the knee issues maybe got introduced when I, when I started trying to deadlift so heavy or hitting those goals. Okay. So, but then it kind of carried through to some of those squats and stuff like that. And then the advice that you gave to me like uh, a few months before we went into this whole lockdown thing or whatever, just to really push the knees out or exactly what you were demoing before. And that seems to have made the world of a difference. It, it almost seems like I'm doing like a frog squat where I'm like, yeah like I'm pushing my knees out or it's like, that's where the focus is. And I can get the depth, like you said, and it's just push your knees out more and just almost overemphasize that. And then it's just a little bit different way of squatting and the knee issues totally go away. So awesome. if I just keep focusing on that, that, that was, that was probably my, my weak link or whatever. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a question, but. So that's not a sumo deadlift then right away or a sumo no, squat. No, I'm talking about a squat. Oh, but you can squat really wide too. Yeah. 
Like, not really. You know, different stances when you, you can you can approach different stances, but that that again goes to you know George your unique situation, right? Some people they they you know there might be a bodybuilder out there with no knee issues, right? And they'll do narrow stance squats because those really really hit their quads, right? Mm. But um, but then taking a wider stance might be what's good for you because it, it loads your hips properly and then it feels better on your knees and your glutes get strengthened. And then, you know, it, it kind of leads to this lessening of inflammation over time in your knees. And then your knees generally just feel, <clears throat> man, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> better. It's your coffee. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Where's my coffee? It's all in the target turf right now. <laughs> Hopefully Curtis didn't hear that. Uh, <laughs> watch the recording, Curtis. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is recorded. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I, that's, that's pretty much what I got. I do hope it, it kind of helps. I hope it kind of makes sense. It, it, uh, yep. it helps you to think about it. Um, yeah, I, I would really... One more, one more comment. Um, just the whole thing about tucking your belly button in, or that's kind of... Um, I think I was overcompensating often and then arching my back in a lot of things because I know I wasn't supposed to round my back. So I'm like, Oh, okay. So kind of go more the other way. And then just the, when you guys tell us to just tuck your belly button in and now it just kind of forces everything to be straight and not like overcompensating. So yeah. that's been really helpful. And it, it's a trap to slip into the, the overarching or whatever, because you don't want to round. So I yeah. just have to think about tucking in. Or tucking belly in your button. bum. Your, yeah, your bum or your belly button or whatever, yeah. I find and that I, easier. With the belly, I feel like I can't feel it in, engaged a lot of times. Like, just because I've had kids, I can't, like, I can't feel like I'm sucking it in or anything. Like, it's like, am I really engaging it like I'm supposed to be doing? Like, I don't know. I just feel like I can't feel that part. So if someone says instead, well, you know, tuck your bum in, well, that I can feel. Yeah. Not as much the belly. I just... Yeah. Um, and you want, that's definitely a situation where I would say like, you know, having kids makes that tougher. I'm not going to try and take that away from anybody. Um, as far as that goes, um, thinking about it and, and, and that's where, you know, taking it nice and slow and, and focusing even on, on tucking the bottom, that kind of stuff. It, when, when one happens, the other one tends to fall into place as well. I, I find same thing because it's just, it's, it's the exact same way as, as when, like I said, one of these things is out of whack. All the other ones tend to start to get out of whack over time, right? The, other, the reverse is true, right? When you can get, especially if you were talking about the hips, right? Which is what you were talking about with the glutes there or the core. Those are kind of directly related. When those things fall into place, the other ones really start to kind of, it has a cascade effect, which is what's really, really cool right. with the body and its ability to like adapt and stuff, right? So if tucking the bum helps, helps you and, you know, bracing through your core helps you, George, I would say, you know, Take, take from that uh, your, unique, your unique individuals and, uh, and that's uh, how you guys each think about it. It's awesome. Um, yeah, what was, there was something else I was gonna say, I just forgot what. Right, oh, you guys were talking about like the whole, you were saying you wanted to get your shoulders back but then you noticed that right away is that kind of caused a bit more arching through your back. That again, goes back to hopefully what we can work on here, which is, right, if you're dealing with a tight T-spine, and now you, I'm asking you to your, bring your shoulders back, but you don't have the mobility to do that, right? The next pl place down the line, which is your lumbar spine, is mm -hmm. the next place that's going to start to be, going to try and contribute to getting your torso up more, right? Which then causes some of those lower back issues uh, and some of that lower back pain, right? So it's it just kind of goes back to how it's all related and stuff. But uh, yeah, that is what I got, guys. I hope that it was somewhat interesting. <laughs> yes, it was, it was very helpful. interesting. Very helpful. Cool. Good breakdown. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, honestly, we can, we can chat a little bit, yeah, if you want or whatever, but I'll still stop.